Hello, everybody. My name is Olivia Mattis, and I'm president and co-founder of the Sousa Mendez Foundation. And it's my privilege to welcome you all to today's event to do with the hero of the Holocaust, um, Chuni Sugihara, and this beautiful film that we all saw called Persona Non Grata. So with us today as our featured speakers are Dr. Mordechai Paldiel. Uh, Dr. Paldiel, will you wave so people can see you? Wonderful. And uh, maybe we'll unmute you, say a word so you're full screen. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, we will talk today about one of the most fascinating stories that has come out out of the Holocaust. Wonderful. And our other special guest, of course, is our filmmaker, Chelan Gluck. So, Chelan, can you say a few words and waves so people see you? Hello, hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. And thank you, everyone, for responding to my last minute barrage of invitations. It's great to see all these familiar faces. Thank you. And everyone else as well. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. Terrific. So let's let in some more people from the waiting room. Wonderful. Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, Dr. Mordechai Paldiel, let's start with you. Dr. Paldiel was for 25 years the director of the Department for the Righteous at Yad Vashem. He personally oversaw the Sugihara case uh, when it came before him. And um, he's really uh, one of the world's experts on this fascinating story. So uh, let's start with you, Dr. Paldiel. What would you like to say to our group? Well, uh, I'll say the following. Uh, here we have a story uh, of a Japanese diplomat uh, who uh, his expertise was Russian affairs. He also spoke the Russian language. And uh, he was, uh, uh, he started his career by being stationed in Manchuria, Manchuria, China. Uh, in the 1930s, when uh, Manchuria had been detached from China by the Japanese who took over Manchuria. And they, uh, they, they made Manchuria into a puppet state. And the name was changed to Manchukyo. And uh, he was there on a diplomatic mission uh, to ward off the Russians. Uh, there, there was a train which passed Manchuria on the way to Vladivostok, the main uh, Pacific seaport of the Russians. So he negotiated with the Russians uh, with regard to uh, the train. So I don't want to talk about this, but when, when he finished that assignment or when he was recalled, and there are various stories what caused him to be recalled, he was then sent uh, to, in a different direction. He was sent to Konas, uh, otherwise known by Jews as Kovno, also in Polish, it's spelled Kovno, but it was then the capital of Lithuania. Uh, today, the capital of Lithuania is Vilna, but then it, Vilna was then part of Poland and Konas was the capital. He was sent there for the first time. The Japanese opened a mission in Kovno, in Konas, uh, not because they had any commercial interest, uh, but simply when he arrived there, he learned that he had been sent there in order to spy. To spy on what? on the movements of German troops towards the uh, border with where the Russians were. The Russians, by then, when he arrived there in uh, late 1939, uh, Poland had been divided. Poland had already been conquered uh, and divided between the uh, Germany and the Soviet Union. And there stood little Lithuania. Now, briefly, uh, Japan and, and Nazi Germany had concluded an alliance. And uh, the Japanese had told, uh, the Japanese were informed by the Germans that the Germans planned to attack the Soviet Union, but they were not told when. Hitler had forbidden from uh, his military to tell the Allies, his ally, Japan, when the attack on the Soviet Union was to take place. Now this was very unnerving to the Japanese because they had the Japanese were keeping a large army, a huge army, the Kwantung army, they called it, stationed facing the Soviet Union in Manchuria. 
and they wanted to remove that army because the Japanese were planning uh, their goal was uh, to dominate the Southeast Pacific, the Philippines, uh, Thailand, and so on, and to challenge the United States, which we know took place on Pearl Harbor. But they wanted, before removing that huge army, they wanted to know when the Germans are going to hit the Russians so they could remove the army, but the Germans would not tell them. So Sugihara's goal was to make use of spies, mostly Polish spies, on troop movements of the Germans towards the Russian area as an indication that indeed, here we go, the invasion is about to begin. That he learned when he came to uh, Konas. He had never been involved with refugees. He had never been involved with Jews. Maybe he met some Jews in China, there were some Jews there, but that was not his job. He was a diplomat, and here he is on a spy mission in Konas. That is the beginning of the story. So now let's turn to our filmmaker, Mr. Chelan Gluck. So uh, Chelan, can you tell us what led you to make this film? Um, well, I mean, it's a long story. I mean, it's, it's, it's actually several overlaying, shall we say, you know, synchronous, synchronous events in the fact, in the sense that I was given a book many years ago by a friend of mine called The Fugu Plan. Uh, written by Rabbi Tolkai, or that, and that's the first time that I, I heard about the Sugihara story, and but I also grew up in Kobe, Japan, where most of the the refugees ended up before scattering around the world. But you know, we'll go back on that later. But when we grew up in Kobe, I mean, there was the synagogue in Kobe, but nobody really talked about it. And then after the film came out, and after things came. You know, and, and the story was starting to be told. I had friends come to tell me, says, oh, yeah, my mother told me that there were a lot of Jews came through, you know, and things like that. But I'm digressing. And um, I happened to work on a film with Mr. Karasawa, who plays Sugihara. Um, let's see, that's almost not nine years ago. It was, a, it, was an inv- it was a film about the invasion of um, Saipan. And he and I hit it off, and um, we were talking about doing something else. And the... Uh, studio came to us about three years after we made that first film and, and presented both of us with that, with the, with the story and said, we're thinking of doing this as our 70th anniversary film, 70th anniversary of the end of the war film. Uh, what do you think? And Karasawa-san was kind enough to say, yeah, I'd love to do it, but you know, if I'm going to do it and it's going to be not, it's not going to be in Japanese and it's going to be overseas, you know, Chellen has to direct it. So I said, all right, thank you. And uh, off we went. Uh, that's about it in a nutshell. <laughs> so had you never heard the story before that point? I mean, you know, I had heard the story as a, as a, as a kid in Kobe. My, my father had told me about it and his best friend. And, but, you know, it was one of those things that just, what, nobody made a big deal out of it. It was just one of those many stories that was told. And it never came, it never really came to the forefront until... Uh, my friend gave me the book, and we were talking about making the the Rabbi Tolkai's or you know the story of Sugihara into a film. But the the whole thing with the Fugu plan is so huge; it's so much bigger than not just one man and and, and his accomplishments. Um, and then you know, as, as fortune would have it, four or five years later, this one rolled into my lap, and a friend of mine who. Uh, my producer is a very close friend of mine who also produced another film that I did called the Japanese remake of Sideways. He came and said, look, let's do this and let's make it an exciting story so that it will interest people. And uh, that's why we have the film that we do now. So are there questions that you would like to ask to each other? Uh, not yet, <laughs> not yet. But I would like to continue with your permission and explain what happened there the situation in that little country called Lithuania, which was about to be swallowed up by the Soviet Union. Uh, The Soviet Union had received permission because they signed uh, a treaty with Nazi Germany on the eve of the war, and and Lithuania and Latvia were to be within the Soviet sphere of influence. So people suspected that the Soviet Union was uh, about to find an excuse uh, to uh, make Lithuania part of the Soviet Union, and which that happened in 1940. Now, in Lithuania, there were Jews, thousands of Jews who were Lithuanian citizens. But then there were thousands of Jews who were not Lithuanian citizens, who had fled to Lithuania when Germany invaded Poland. And they were stuck in Lithuania. 
uh, and they wanted to get out. Now, to get out, uh, in the meantime, the war expanded in the West as the Germany uh, uh, took over the Scandinavian countries, uh, France, Belgium, and Holland. And so the escape was to leave from the West where there was a war was impossible. So what happened was that uh, there were in Lithuania also, uh, among those who fled from Poland, where uh, the uh, students and the rabbis from uh, well-known yeshivas in Poland. Uh, one of them is known as the Mir Yeshiva, M-I-R. And they were there sitting in Lithuania and uh, they were not particularly concerned. Uh, but there were others who were concerned and in order to get out, from Lithuania, the only way was from, from the other side, from Russia. Uh, but uh, how do you get a transit visa from the Soviet Union? Uh, you had to show, the big thing in, the, uh, in those days is, you had to show an end visa. You had to show where your final destination is. In other words, if you wanted to get a transit visa, in other words, a transit from one country to the other, you had to show that you had a visa from a country where you could actually come in and stay there. Now, the United States was not giving out visas. England was from, uh, to Palestine, there was a very limited number of visas that the British were giving out. And so what do you do? How do you get out from Lithuania? Especially these Polish people who were on the status of refugees, and they were afraid that one day the Lithuanians are gonna turn them back and hand them back to the Germans. They wanted to get out. So, in one of the yeshivas, there were two students who had come from Holland to study in the yeshiva, very religious people. And they wanted to get out, and they went to see the Dutch ambassador in Riga. Riga, a man by the name of D. Decker. Uh, and they said, we want to get out, we want to go back, well, we can't go back to Holland because Holland is occupied by Germany. But there was a Dutch government in exile operating in London, and they still have control over the Dutch colonies. Uh, and so uh, these two students said, give us a visa uh, to go to the Dutch uh, East Indies, in other words, what is today Indonesia. Uh, the Dutch uh, ambassador said, no, that's impossible, you can't go there. Uh, the Indonesia had not yet been at, uh, occupied by the Japanese. So they said, how about going to uh, the other Dutch colonies uh, in West Indies, in Suriname, and in Curaçao? Because we want to get out. And we're Dutch citizens, so we're Yeshiva, but we come from, from Holland. And so the ambassador said, let me have a look. And he said, well, uh, you know what? I have some bad news for you guys. In order to go to Suriname and Curaçao, you don't even need a visa you need a special permission by the Dutch governor there. And that Dutch governor is not gonna give you permission. So forget about Vivas. So these two students then went back uh, and they told this to a man by the name of and he And then he said, go back to that ambassador and ask them, are you willing to put on uh, our passport that first statement, simply, there is no need, no need, no visa is required to uh, for entry into Suriname or Curaçao and leave out the second statement which says you need a special permit from the governor. Just write the first. Now we have an end visa. We have a destination. So they went back to the DECA and DECA said, all right. So he wrote it down. And so they had already a destination. Once they had a destination, they can try to get a transit visa to go to supposedly to Curaçao, okay? Now, let's take it a step further. Then there was a, uh, there was a uh, Dutch consul in, uh, in Kovno, in Konas. Actually, he's a representative of the Philips company and he was nominated at the last moment. And so other, when, when these two students told the story, that, that, were, that, that raised the alert of the others and they said, maybe we too can get that, that statement on our passport uh, and uh, we have an end visa. Well, now you have an end visa, now you need a transit visa. So you have to transit through the Soviet Union, which you know the Soviet Union is quite a big, large country from one end to the other. And the Soviet Union, uh, uh, they went to see the Soviet uh, ambassador. Lithuania was still an independent country. And uh, he said, well, uh, how are you gonna make it to Curaçao? 
uh, because after the Soviet Union, there was another country, an empire called Japan. <laughs> In other words, we, the Soviet Union, are not going to give you a transit visa unless you can show that you have a transit visa to continue via Japan. Because from Japan, you can take a boat, cross the Pacific, cross the Panama Canal, and go to Corsair. As you can see here on the map, you can see you can cross Russia and uh, go to Japan and then take a boat, cross the Panama Canal, and you are in Curacao. So the Russians said, if you can get a Japanese transit visa, we'll give you a Russian. And so that's when all of these people lined up in front of the Japanese consulate general. And one morning, Sugihara wakes up and he has a breakfast, and his wife, Yukiko, says there are hundreds of people waiting outside and uh, they don't look like they, they are the spies that we need to tell us about the German troop movement. These are not the spies because he had his Polish spies that were working for him. And he said, well, I'm, I'm prepared to, to meet a delegation. Not right away, it took a few days. And then the delegation came to him with Zerah Barhaftig and they said, the honor, I will show you. And they stretched out a map and they said, look, we have an end visa to go to Kurosau. We really want to go to Kurosau. It's a beautiful island and so forth. And we have it here. And uh, we have that statement where we don't need a visa. In other words, we can go there. We have to transfer to the Soviet Union. And then the Soviet Union said, how about Japan? How about you giving us a transit? We're not gonna stay in Japan. We'll only be 10 days. And from Japan, we'll take a Japanese boat. We'll pay all the fares. Will you please give us a Japanese transit visa? All of this happened towards the end of July. By then, when they went to see Sugihara, the Soviet, the Russians had already moved in into Lithuania. Uh, they uh, organized a fake vote. According to the vote, Lithuania asked to be admitted into the Soviet Union. And uh, the Soviet Union consented. And on August 8, 1940, Lithuania became a Republic of the Soviet Union. In other words, it became part, part of the Soviet Empire. Okay. So uh, the urgency to get out was even, was even bigger. Now, to make a long story short, Sugihara asked his government in Tokyo, the foreign ministry, can I issue transit visas for people who will not stay in Japan, Let's not worry. And the answer was, you can only issue to those who, on an individual basis, not on a mass basis, make sure it's not enough that they have an end visa. Do they have enough money on them? to undertake that huge travel. First of all, to take a train across the length of the Soviet Union, and that you had to pay in dollars. And then uh, uh, take a boat into Japan, and then stay in Japan for 10 days or two weeks, and uh, accommodation. And then a boat all the way to Curaçao. Do they have enough funds? Uh, if not, don't give them a visa. So this is what Sugihara overlooked. So he did not disobey. This is not the case like the Portuguese uh, 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 Consul General in Bordeaux, Sousa Mendes, who was told very clearly, don't issue any visas. The Japanese says, issue very carefully all the individuals. We don't want a stampede of these refugees. Now, what he did, he did issue these transit visas, okay? And of course, in addition with the statement that this is for travel to Curaçao, uh, and uh, there were some people who still didn't have that transit, that Curaçao thing, but they said, well, when we get to Vladivostok, maybe we'll go down to Shanghai, uh, or maybe we'll go down, uh, we'll try to go to Palestine, or we'll try to go to Canada. And he said, all right, I'll give you a transit visa. He got so much involved in that, and time was running out because the Russians told him, you have to leave the place by August 30, because this is now the Soviet Union. And we don't want these foreign embassies and foreign consulate. They're all a bunch of spies, so you have to get out. So he was in a hurry, and he had to issue the transit visas, and he had to do it in calligraphy until he had a stamp made out. And so the final account was that uh, he issued several thousand. There's a dispute among historians. Is it uh, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000? Because if you add husbands and wives and families, and by the time he got out, on the train, the train which took him back to Berlin, where the uh, Japanese ambassador was. Uh, by the time he got out, he was even issuing uh, these visas 
uh, while he was at the train station. Uh, so he got out and he got the, the additional uh, assignments. One assignment was in Prague. He was a half a year in Prague. And then he was in Königsberg for another half a year. And then he was sent to uh, Bucharest uh, in Romania, also on the Russian border. And then when the, when the Russians came into Bucharest, and, uh, he was detained. And he, he was not in Japan until 1947. When he came back to Japan in 1947, he was asked to submit his res resignation. Japan in 1947 was not Japan in 1940. It was a conquered country. The Americans were in charge. Japan was a defeated country. Uh, now, uh, the assumption is, had he returned to Japan, uh, when, uh, not as a conquered country, he might have been severely punished uh, for, for issuing these thousands of this because he was even told uh, by the foreign ministry to stop issuing that as these people were arriving in Japan. And they disregarded that and he continued to issue that. He claimed that he did it that out of the humanitarian consideration. But in 1947, the Japanese were not in a position to punish him. They just asked him to be dismissed, uh, to resign. And he resigned. He got a very small pension from the Japanese foreign ministry. And, but, but not enough to make a living. It was a very difficult time in Japan. And he went and he found all kinds of jobs and this and that. And finally, he found a job uh, representing a commercial firm. They sent him to Moscow. And uh, he was in Moscow when the history came to Yad Vashem. And it just happened that uh, at the time I was there, and uh, it came to uh, it came to to me in 1983. Uh, I was already at Yad Vashem in charge of the department, and uh, we did a little of investigation. He was still alive, and uh, we our committee we had a committee for these purposes. Our committee decided to declare him a righteous among the nations. That was in 1984. Uh, but the ceremony took place in 1985 uh, in Tokyo by our ambassador, and he received the honor, and uh, he died a year later, 1986. Uh, the Japanese are since then celebrating him, uh, the Hill of Humanity for him in his hometown, and uh, this is their great hero from the Holocaust. You know, they have a chip on their shoulders because they were allied to Nazi Germany, but here was a great humanitarian who did not obey, he disobeyed in some way. Uh, he, he, he interpreted the immigration laws according to him, but he did not go according uh, to the instructions that he received. As a result, up to 6,000 Jews, if you include their wives and children, uh, made it to uh, Vladivostok, at least to Vladivostok. Many of them made it to Japan. Some of them overstayed. They were supposed to be only 10 days, but they overstayed in Kobe. The Kobe was the place where most of these Jews gathered, and they were supported by various organizations, including the Joint. And from there, many of them then went to Shanghai, a, a large Jewish community. Some went to the Philippines, some went to Canada, and some from, uh, from Japan, uh, they made their way to Palestine under the British. They had British certificates, some of them. Uh, so... Uh, if you add the, the 6,000 to the children and grandchildren, you come to a huge number of at least uh, 20, 25,000 that are alive today. Thanks to that, uh, maybe more, uh, thanks to that Japanese uh, diplomat, uh, a very humble person who never uh, sought any credit and any honors for himself, uh, who uh, was there, uh, who had come to Lithuania on a completely uh, different agenda, and uh, he decided uh, he was going to also to be a humanitarian. He was going to save lives, especially that these people uh, that he was issuing visas in no way would cause any harm to the imperial in uh, interest of the empire of Japan. So that is the story of Sugihara in a nutshell. Shalon, what would you like to say? Um, I guess I'm gonna to have to go back and watch the movie. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, well, thank you very much. And my question was, I was, I wanted to ask you how his story came to the Yad Vashem. Um, but now you've told me, so um, I guess that's about you know that that that's my recap on uh, on Mordechai's uh, explanation. Um, you know, besides that, 
of I have no arguments with what he said. I mean, it is all it is all as he said. So, well, I would love to know from you, Chellen, about poetic license and what poetic license did you take in the film, and where where did you feel compelled to really be strictly uh, true to history? Well, I think I mean the problem is the majority of just like anything else, uh, just like any other history, uh, the majority of what we know about Sugihara is oral history from various different people. I mean, obviously, except for the documents and the telegrams and the communication between Sugihara and the, and, and the foreign ministry, you know, and, and the request to issue visas and the denials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, except for some of those official documents and the, the list that he actually kept, a lot of it is, you know, for the lack of a better word, I'm gonna say hearsay. And, uh, and we, when, when the studio said that we're going to make a film, my producer, Mr. S Mr. Watakura, went out and said, okay, what are we going to do? You know, let's, we've got to find something that's a basis that we're going to base our, our movie on. And there was a, a book written by a gentleman named Mr. Shiraishi, who was a former employee of the Japanese Foreign Ministry. And he wrote a treatise. It's more of a treatise than a book. And it's the best, I would say, the best translation into English for the title of his book is Sugihara, the most excellent intelligence officer. And we said, okay, that's great. And in his book or in his treatise, he quotes or he has, you know, he makes references to other sources and things like that, which made it, I'm not going to say which made it easier for us, but it at least gave us an outline that we could follow. And obviously without any disrespect meant whatsoever, you can't fill two hours with somebody writing visas for 29 days. And obviously nobody's going to watch a movie if that's all he's doing. I mean, you've got to, we've got to try and dig into the reasons of why he did what he did, you know, and a little bit of his history and, 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 and a little bit of the history afterwards. It's a lot of it is supposition. A lot of it is dramatic license, as you say, but I would say that the meat of the story of who the man was, what he did, why he did what he did and the way that he affected people, was as you know was as, as 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 close as we could get to be i mean for example his polish assistant and driver pesh his character is actually an amalgam of anywhere from ha half a dozen to a dozen polish intelligence officers who worked with him throughout the years not only in Kaunas, but we were told that he had polish officers aiding him in in his other posts and as you know poland didn't exist as a country so these were polish underground officers who were outside expatriate Pol Poles who were helping Sugihara and, and Sugihara was helping them in return by letting them use you know, his, his, his channels for communication, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, obviously uh, the character of Irina um, is, you know, I can't help it. Ever since I was a little kid, Casablanca was my favorite movie, you know? <laughs> and, and what's a movie without a love story? Um, you know, if anybody else would like to point out or have any specific questions, you know, those are those are the two big, shall we say, deviations from the from from the story itself. The incident, then the beginning with the train and the hijacking of the train. That's a dramatization of many things that happened at that time that that allowed or that that so for for what reason Sugihara was declared persona non grata by the Russians. I mean, the big thing there was that as the Russians were were trying to get some money out of the Japanese for selling them the Great Northern Manchurian Railroad. Sugihara actually traveled dressed as a, as a railroad worker at times, as a peasant at times, as various people just traveling the trains and interviewing the workers, everybody else, and really and, and, and examining what was going on. And our, our incident that's depicted dramatized in the film comes from, from records that, or, or stories that we've heard that the Russians were actually pulling back their newest equipment and sending it back to Russia so that when they sold the system to the Japanese, it was nothing but a shell of a system and, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why the actual selling price dropped by quite a huge amount. The Russians were not happy with them. And they said, okay, this guy, here's the railroad, but by the way, he's not coming to Moscow. Um, you know, so there are other, I mean, there are things, like I said, there are amalgams of people are amalgams of others. You know, the, the young Jewish mother, she doesn't even have a name. We called her the young Jewish mother. She started out as, as the mother of two children and appeared in one or two scenes in the beginning. And for us, you know, to go back to 
my uh, high school English teacher, Dr. Creasel, and the everyman stories, you know, she became our everyman in the story. She became the representation of one of the representations of many of the Jewish refugees that we could follow throughout so that we don't get too lost by having a cast of thousands. You know, it's not Ben Hur, but so we tried to, so we tried to make the story as digestible, shall we say, or as followable as, as, as possible. I mean, another bit of trivia, if you remember, if the, for those of you who've seen the film, if you remember the scene where, you know, Yukiko is on a hill and it looks like a big sweeping shot and she's got her parasol and things and the car chase, but that's how the film began. I mean, we had it much more like a James Bond film, jumping all over history and things. There's so much detail and so much history that we, even those of us who studied the history, were unfamiliar with that we had to take it back and, and put the film back in proper chronological order so that it was something that could be followed. I'd like um, to say something, uh, Salin. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I, I happen to be a great Israeli patriot. Uh, I served in the Israeli army. I fought in the Six Day War. Uh, so I was very happy to see in the film that when the boat approached Japan. Uh, I knew I was going to get in trouble for this from somebody. <laughs> no, they all sang uh, the Hatikva, uh, yes. which uh, I, I doubt maybe it was not the Hatikva they were singing. Maybe they were singing the international uh, or whatever. But, well, uh, uh, but that's, that's very nice uh, that they all sang the Hatikva. They knew it by heart. But I want to say something else, really. Uh, uh, there was in this film, uh, which is very good, it came out, uh, uh, Sugihara and his, uh, his position on whether uh, Japan should uh, go to war with the United States. All right, so uh, that's, that's an important point that, that should be mentioned. Uh, there were two uh, opinions in the Foreign Ministry of uh, Japan. One opinion was that a conflict with the United States was unavoidable because of the American interests in the Pacific, uh, and America was standing in the way for Japanese expansion uh, in those areas that Jap Japan was going to expand. That's one opinion, and the conflict was unavoidable, and that led to Pearl Harbor. They had the upper hand. The other opinion of the foreign ministry was uh, that it would be foolish uh, uh, to go to war with the United States. Uh, it could end in a disaster. Nobody thought about an atomic bomb, but it could end in a, in a defeat. And uh, it was best to try to find an accommodation through negotiations with the United States. And indeed, the Japanese amb ambassador in Washington, who was not told about Pearl Harbor, he was actually negotiating. Maybe negotiating is fair. And he different. was late. <laughs> and he was late. So Sugihara belonged to those people who were against going to war with the United States. He felt it was a mistake. In the film, I don't know whether he actually screamed at the Polish, at the German ambassador in Berlin. Uh, Japanese diplomats don't scream at their superiors and they don't shout. That's not the way. Oh, trust me. When we shot that scene, they were about as, as, as respectful as possible. There were several things that I asked him to do. And he said, no, I would never do that to a superior. Yeah. And, and, you know, and of course, he's very apologetic the whole time. So I apologize. And I'm so, sorry. Uh, anyway, but, but it's true that the film shows that the Japanese uh, ambassador in Berlin, Oshima, he was in favor of the alliance with Nazi Germany. He was only troubled that he didn't know when the, when the, Je the Germans were going to attack the, the, the Russians. So uh, that's an important point to point out that Sugihara uh, felt that the Japanese was, Japan was going on the wrong course which would end in disaster, and which indeed, indeed uh, it did end in disaster. So that's a point that uh, should be mentioned also. Okay, so I'd like to start getting to questions that people have, questions and comments, and I encourage people to type their questions and comments into the chat window. And if I may, I, I would just like to see, I mean, I can't see all the windows, but you know, this is something I like to do at every Q&A session. I'm sorry we can't see all 100 plus people at once, but I'll try to scroll through the scenes, I mean the screens. I just like to know how many people that are attending here tonight are, are either descendants of Sugihara visa recipients or, you know, are relatives or have friends that are, that are so. And, you know, you can either raise your hand in the picture, I'll look at that, or there is a way, I guess, reactions and put your thumbs up, um, just as a matter of curiosity. Uh, so, yeah, why don't people raise their hands and then we can actually see you. Two, three, four, five. 
I'm I'm just scrolling through. I'm counting six, seven, eight. You know, at least eight people. I mean, that that's it's just amazing how many people Sugihara you know affected. Even now, even within this small sampling of of, of people. That's incredible. And uh, yeah, so please. Let's... So, so th there's a question. Uh, I think I know the answer, but to you, Dr. Paldiel, did you ever personally meet Mr. Sugihara? No, uh, um, he had died already in 1986. Uh, I did meet uh, his wife, Yokika. She came to Yad Vashem. Uh, we hosted her. I was the master of ceremonies uh, uh, where we celebrated her and we honored her, uh, Yukiko. Uh, she uh, spoke and she claimed that uh, she was pushing her husband uh, in order to, uh, to help out these people. He at the beginning was hesitating because that was not his job. He was afraid he was get, getting involved in something which uh, really would derail him for what he was supposed to do and might get him into, in trouble with his superiors. You know, this is 1940 when Japan was on a, on a victory march. It was, uh, it was adding more countries to its domination. Uh, but she, she's the one that subtly uh, encouraged them to try to do something for these people uh, so she spoke about this, uh, and uh, it was quite impressive. Uh, of course, she spoke in Japanese, and her words were translated into English. So I did not meet him. No, he was already gone by the time uh, we all wanted to meet him, and, and at Yad Vashem too. So there's a question from someone wondering how she can find out if a relative of hers was saved by Sugihara. So there is a list, right? But I don't know if the list is complete. How would one consult the list? And is there someone who would be able to give her an answer? There are several lists. They are, he himself, when uh, this, this didn't come out in the film, he, he didn't go straight to, from, uh, from uh, Lithuania to Königsberg. He, for, he was for six months in Prague. Uh, which then was already under German control. But he was first in Prague because the Germans would not allow any foreign diplomat to be in Königsberg, which was very close to the Russian zone. They were assembling an army there to invade Russia. So it took, uh, it took uh, the Japanese uh, half a year before the Germans consented uh, for him to go to Königsberg. So he, was, uh, so he was in Prague. While he was in Prague, uh, his father, the foreign minister, Right, uh, Matsuoka asked him uh, to prepare a list, and he uh, he drew up a list. Uh, he had time to type it up. He or his secretary, and that list was sent to Tokyo. And so there is that initial list that he prepared. I think there's 2,600 names there. 2,601. I forgot the exact number, but right. he only has he only has the name, and not of all the family members. Okay. Uh, so later on, there are other lists that came up, which added uh, more people. Uh, uh, there is a, a, a thought that uh, Sugihara may have given more than 2,600, but uh, he felt uh, he was going to give a smaller number uh, for his own, uh, to secure his career, not to, not to enlarge that number. So 2,600 is large. But uh, he may have given more than that, uh, but he didn't want to mention all the names uh, to his superiors. So uh, that is, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, he died in 1986 before all these things could be clarified with him. Uh, but at least uh, uh, 2,600 and uh, probably more than that. Uh, and uh, there, there, there are Sugihara foundations and so on where all the, the names of uh, these people uh, appear in alphabetical order. The first one, he, which he himself made while he was in Prague. So, uh, Chalan, there are a few uh, questions about Irena, but uh, she's fictional, right? I mean, she is based on, he was married. He was married to a Russian woman in, 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 uh, in Claudia, in uh, Manchuria. Uh, that's why, I mean, she, and she was a, um, an, a Russian Orthodox Christian. And as a matter of fact, he converted and there, there, or at least. Oh, are you muted? You're muted. Wait, wait, wait. We have to unmute you or unmute yourself. There. I hate that. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, uh, okay. So where were we? 
I mean, Irina is based on a character and based on his actual wife. He was married to a woman named Claudia and in Manchuria, she was a Russian Orthodox uh, Christian and he actually converted, or shall we say, at least they had a Russian wedding. And that's why when you see the scene in the, in the, in, in the, in the church, you'll see that those of you who noticed, he crosses himself in the correct way as they would in the Orthodox church and not in the Roman Catholic church. Um, and there have been, you know, he has, there have been references made to him saying that he did, you know, he, he did this for, he did what he did for a greater power. We didn't want to, we did not want to introduce the religious element into the film more than we did. Um, because, you know, he did what he did because of who he was and not because of any other beliefs or any outside. We just like to believe that there was, it wasn't any outside influence that, that, that caused him to be the humanitarian that he was. Uh, and I lost track because of the button. Where were we? Did I answer that correctly? Oh, okay, Irina. Um, why did we create that? Like I said, it's a combination of that and a combination of not mentioning the fact that he had been married previously uh, at the request of, you know, the, at, at the studio's request. And uh, like I said, I'll go back on it before I, I love Casablanca. What can I say? Okay. Now here's a message for, do, for a question for Dr. Paldiel. Somebody writes, I heard that the two Dutch students were not the first to conceptualize the end visa concept, but rather that of Nat Lewin's mother, also Dutch, whose visa was granted prior to the Dutch students. Are you aware of this info, Dr. Paldiel? Yes, uh, well, they are two versions. One of them is this woman, her name is Pesia Levine, and uh, she was from Holland. And uh, she married uh, Mr. Levine, who was a Polish citizen, uh, in, and they were in Lithuania. So it's she that went to the Dutch ambassador in uh, Riga, Latvia, next door to Lithuania, and that she found out this Curaçao idea. So it's not uh, these two students. She's the first one. And he said, I can, I can give that statement. I can write it down on your passport on uh, your Dutch, she still had a Dutch passport, uh, that there's, uh, there's no need for a visa in Curaçao. And she said, how about my husband? And he said, well, your husband is what? He said, well, he's a Polish citizen, I can't do that. But anyway, they had a little talk and he said, all right, I'll put it on, on the passport of your husband as well. Uh, so when she came back to Konas from Riga, uh, she told this to other people and that's how it got to the ears of Zerach uh, Wahrhaftig. Uh, I simply, uh, I'm sorry, Selen, that Zerch uh, Wahrhaftig does not appear at all in the film, but he was very important in this yes, story. He was. he was very important because he was dealing with trying to find ways to get people. He represented what is called the Palestine office, and he had received British certificates, but the problem was how to get them out and get them to Palestine from Lithuania. And he is the one that went to see Sugihara, and he spread out a map and he showed them, look, this is Curaçao and this is where we are. We have to get from one place to another. Uh, he, also, he also showed up at Sugihara's doorstep with over 200 pieces of, you know, documents. That's right. So uh, uh, you have there a bearded man. Uh, maybe that's him, uh, but he, although at that time he didn't have a beard. He belonged to the religious Zionist organization, Mizrahi, religious Zionist. Okay. I want to say something about Sugihara, uh, about uh, Zerach Wahaptik. I knew him very well. I interviewed him. Later on, he was a minister of religious affairs. I have to mention, Sukihara visited Israel uh, before it came, the story came to the knowledge of Yad Vashem. And, he, and uh, Wahaftik uh, met with, Wahaftik was a minister, and Sukihara asked Wahaftik for a favor. Uh, one of his three sons uh, found it very hard uh, to make a living, he was interested in, in the diamond business. So uh, Wahaftik arranged for Sugihara's youngest son to work in, uh, in Netanya uh, in the diamond business. And then uh, from Netanya, he left from Antwerp. He may still be there. Antwerp is also a diamond center. So these two people, uh, Zerach Wahaftik and uh, Sugihara met in Israel, but it didn't come to the attention of Yad Vashem. It's very strange. They kept it to themselves. But Zerah uh, Wahaftik then gave a, a full account and he said that uh, 
uh, this yeshiva of Mir, they were all Polish uh, students, and he went to see the chief rabbi, and he said, you got to get yourself, first of all, a piece of paper, a passport, because maybe we can get a visa one of these days. If you don't have a passport, even a, a temporary passport, you're not going to get a visa, because there's not going to be a visa to be put on, on anything, you know. And, uh, and so they went to the... Uh, they still, the, the Lithuanians allowed the Poles to have an office in Kovnaus, although Poland didn't exist in it to a nation. So these, these hundreds of uh, Talmudic students went from uh, where the yeshiva was located in Kaidan in Lithuania, and they got a temporary Polish passport. Later on, they were able to get the Dutch uh, transit visa and uh, the uh, Japanese. What's interesting about Mir, that is the only yeshiva that all of the student body got out. There were, there were students from other yeshivas, from other Talmudic uh, seminaries, but they got out, all of them, included, uh, including the, the, the rabbis, and they were, they, they were in Kobe. And of course, the Japanese were surprised to find these very Orthodox Jews that they, had, they never had met people like that. And from there, they went to Shanghai, and in Shanghai, they, re they reopened the Mir Yeshiva. There was a Mir Yeshiva, and there are pictures of uh, people sitting in Shanghai and studying the Talmud. So all of this was done thanks to Sugihara. Uh, I met in Brooklyn in the 1980s a rabbi, Zupnik, his name was. He was in a hurry. He had to go to a, to a Talmudic uh, study group in, uh, in Borough Park. Why did I meet Zupnik? Because Sugihara said at the beginning, look, it's going to take me a lot of time to issue these visas because I have to write it out, calligraphy, with my hand. It takes me a lot and my hand tires. I need help. Uh, and so uh, uh, Val Haftig says, if I send you one of the Talmudic uh, students, and uh, Sugeha said, I don't care, send me someone to help me at least to line up the people. Uh, there was a German there who was working there, but they, uh, even he could not... Uh, uh, managed with, with the crowds. with the, And so uh, this man, uh, what, what's his name again? Uh, Rabbi uh, Zupnik, he sat there and he was taking the passport. He checked the passport to see, you know, to see the, the photo, the name of the person. And then he handed it to, uh, uh, to Sugihara and Sugihara then added the visa. Later on, Sugihara got a seal with the calligraphy. And then it was easier for Zupnik simply to, you know, to stamp the visas. So he told me that he stamped at least 100 visas, 100 uh, Japanese transit visas, while next to him was sitting this German who was a Gestapo spy. He was spying on Sugihara. <laughs> but that German told him that he has nothing, he is, there for, he is for Hitler, but he's got nothing against the Jews. They had a conversation. So Zupnik told me, he got nothing against the Jews. And in fact, uh, he once had a Jewish girlfriend. Uh, they had a romance, the romance uh, broke up. And so he has a very good opinion about the Jews, but he's in favor of Nazi Germany. So uh, all of this uh, was told to me by Rabbi Zupnik in Brooklyn. I think it was in 1988 or something. I don't think he's, uh, he's still there. Very interesting. So let's I mean, get some more questions. Of, sorry, sorry to jump in. This might be interesting for everybody here. Speaking of the Mir Yeshiva, we have a representative of the Mir Yeshiva here. My good friend, Debbie Groudens, her father, Rabbi Groudens, was of the Mir Yeshiva. And, and you know what? I'm going to take you up on your offer. You, you, do you want to hold up your visa? Debbie's got one with her. Okay, so she needs to unmute herself and then speak, and then we'll all be able to see her. She's got her sound man with her, so. And I think if everyone clicks on her, does she become full screen if you want to see no, it earlier? No, no, no. She needs to unmute herself and say she's something. Unmuted. Okay, I'm going to. Do you remember that people came to Sugihara with a document? Uh, this is unfortunately a little bit stuck together. Here we go. It was a very long document with numerous stamps on both the front and the back. And you probably remember 
there, there was a scene in the movie with people lining up with this document. So this is a document um, from Kaunas, from the, well, it says Le Tuvos Republica, I'm assuming that is the Lithuanian Republic, from saying get closer. That's a picture of my dad as a very young man. Uh, that could be a Polish document. No, it's a Lithuanian. It's like a Lithuanian, a, okay. A it's Lithuanian. Because the thing is very few of them you know, ended up with their passports. Right. Yeah. So these are the four guys from Mizrahi and the Mir Yeshiva who met with Shioni Sugihara. And here's Vahavtik in, uh, in the middle. This right here is Zorach Varhaftig. Right. This right here is my dad, Samuel Groudens. And I always forget the names of these two gentlemen. I have them written down, and I cannot find where I wrote them down. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Thank you for sharing I, these amazing documents. Um, uh, Dr. I mean, I, I'd like to touch on the, the, the omission, unfortunately, of Varhaftig and, and the Mir Yeshiva. You'll see, you'll see remnants of it in the, throughout the film. If you see when the, when the people are writing visas and there are those helping him, you will see an Orthodox, young Orthodox Jewish man helping him out. And, you know, we had plans for him showing up in the middle of the night with, his, with a duffel bag with two or 300 documents saying, can you help me out? And it's exactly as Mordecai said, you know, I, no, but you know, I need your help. And he ends up staying and helping him doing that. Something had to go. And unfortunately, or some things had to go. There were several episodes in the film that had to go. And unfortunately, that was one of them because we felt that the Jewish side, the plight of the Jews and the Jewish refugees were well represented among others. And unfortunately, Varhaftig had to go or, or his portion of the, of, the, of the story had to go. Um, also, it's, it's not the first time I've gotten in trouble for the Hatikva in the sense that, but the reason, this is an interesting reason, and the reason I forgive it, and the reason that, that I will stand by it, is that the words say, we come from the East. Or, or yes, we come from the East. And my, my Japanese producer loved it. And they are coming to Japan from, I mean, we come to the East. So they are coming to Japan. And of course, that's not what the song was written about. And there are one or two um, references to the Hatik for people breaking out in song. And you are absolutely right. There were those who broke out in the Internationale. I mean, I spoke with another survivor who said they would never sing the Hatikva. My father and her uncles, they were socialists. They would yeah. not sing the Zionist song. And I've been, like I said, I've had to apologize to the Zionists for, having say, for saying this. And I've had to apologize to the the socialists, but I mean, there were, there were the, the, the first several ships were ships full of, of socialists. Many of the people, many of the first refugees who got to Lithuania got there because, you know, they were important representatives of the Jewish population in Poland, including those in the government or those uh, with socialist tendencies. So there were different groups of people that went in, in different boats. I mean, I'm told that the, 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 the ship that we show that ship itself made anywhere from 25 to 28 trips just with the Jewish refugees during the time. So we try to take pieces from everybody's stories and jam, you know, jam it into to two hours. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we'll be forgiven for that. Um, so there are people who are mentioning uh, different permanent memorials for Sugihara. So there's the house in Lithuania where he issued the visas, and yes. then there's the memorial also in Japan. So can you talk about those two places? Uh, there, is, there are several memorials in Japan. I mean, there is the, the town of Tsuruga where everyone landed or where the ships landed. It's the first place they landed. And actually, if you look at the map, it's, as the crow flies, Tokyo and Yokohama are closer to Tsuruga, but the reason they all ended up in, Japan, in Kobe is that Kobe was the second, second major international port in Japan after Yokohama. And because of the Japan Alps, because of Japan's geography and the spine of, of Japan, it was all mountains, 
they took a train down along the Japan Sea coast, and then once you get past the Japan Alps, the quickest way is the quickest port to get to was Kobe. Um, there are now several smaller uh, memorials in Japan. There is a memorial in downtown Los Angeles of Sugihara sitting on a bench on a bench in Japantown. Um, you know, and I've been, like I said, I've been to the to the uh, museum in in Lithuania, and they were of great help to us. Um, so here's a question for Dr. Paldiel. Uh, someone says, in the movie, we see that a classmate of Sugihara, Consul of Japan in Vladivostok, Saburo Ne, also disobeyed orders of Tokyo and issued the boarding visas for Jews to go to Japan. Has he been named righteous among the nations as well? Uh, I don't know about that part. I just know that there's a story in Vladivostok that uh, some people came to Vladivostok uh, and they either they didn't have enough funds uh, to proceed or they did not have the uh, Japanese transit visas on them. Because anyone who had the Japanese transit visas could have proceeded to Japan. There was no problem. But there were some people who arrived in Vladivostok and they had some other transit visas, but not the Japanese one. And they were stuck there. And uh, they wanted to continue with the others to Japan, but they didn't have the uh, Sugihara transit visa. And so they were in Vladivostok and the Russians were very unhappy to have uh, these refugees there on Soviet soil. And uh, the fear was that we're going to send it back all the way back to Lithuania. Uh, and uh, so according to the film, uh, uh, the Japanese man there, or was it the company, uh, made it possible for them also to continue uh, to uh, Japan. I have to say, uh, these people were probably uh, Polish uh, citizens, uh, Polish Jews, and in Japan, in uh, in Kobe or in Tokyo, uh, the Jap the Poles had a consul consulate. The consul man with name was Romer, and some of these Jews who came to uh, uh, who who, uh, who traveled on this route, uh, they 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 traveled uh, on false uh, documents. What are these documents? That's a whole lot of story. These are documents from Paraguay in South America. So they, had, they, they appeared as Paraguayan citizens. And of course, they, they never heard of that country. But here they are, Paraguayan citizens that they obtained from the Polish legation in Switzerland. And they appeared in Vladivostok. And, but they didn't have the Japanese. But they had the, uh, the Polish uh, uh, consul general in, uh, in Japan. And so uh, this Japanese man in Vladivostok made it possible for them to board the boat and go with the others in, uh, uh, to Japan. Once they were in Japan, these people, they uh, received uh, new Polish passports from the Polish uh, Consul General. And with these passports, they proceeded to other destinations. So I'm not so much familiar with the man himself. I never heard of the name, but uh, there might be a story there. So we've reached the end of our hour, but we have not reached the end of the questions. So right now I'm going to tell you a little bit about our upcoming events. Those who would like to leave, please leave. <laughs> Those who have some time, please stay. And we're gonna to get to as many questions as we can. So first of all, about upcoming events. So next week, we're going to have a showing of the film Disobedience, the Sousa Mendez story. And you'll see all of the remarkable parallels between the Sugihara story and the Sousa Mendez story, both happening in 1940. Um, the week following, uh, we have a, a brand new film, uh, actually not even yet released, about a Dutch rescue action. It's a, a woman rescuer. It's a, a film called Truce's Children about our, our Gertruda Weissmuller, who was involved with the whole kinder transport movement, and she uh, rescued actually uh, thousands of children. Uh, and it's quite remarkable because the filmmakers, these Dutch filmmakers have tracked down these children now in their 80s and 90s and uh, have told them the story and most of them had no idea that somebody had saved their lives. So that's quite a remarkable film and it's not been seen by anybody yet. So you'll definitely want to sign up for that. We have also other films upcoming. 
we have the beautiful film called Orchestra of Exiles about the founding of the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra before the State of Israel. So it was the Palestine Philharmonic Orchestra that was also a rescue story. And Dr. Paladiel will again be our special guest for that. Um, and all kinds of other programming. So you will be on our email list. You will see what we have coming up. Most of the programs either are free or very low cost. And we do welcome donations, of course. I'm going to uh, share the screen again, just so that you see our contact information. No, wrong, wrong, wrong share. That was the wrong share. This is what I wanted to share. So um, don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram and uh, uh, Twitter, and uh, we hope to see you at further uh, events. So right now, I think we're going to get to some more questions. Can I say something, uh, Olivia? When I worked at Yad Vashem, uh, one day, a person from the Israeli Philatelic Service came to see me, and he said, we want to make a stamp, an Israeli stamp, with the righteous on it. I said, a great idea. Uh, and he said, do you have any suggestion? I said, yes, how about some diplomats that we honor it? And uh, I gave a description and it was done. So uh, we have a stamp for six, six shekels and I'm gonna show it to you where you have Sugihara. Do you see it? Yes. You have Sugihara, you have Mendes, uh, you have Karl Lutz, you have Ulkerman. Ulkerman was a Turkish man, and you have Perlaska, uh, who was an Italian in Budapest. But here you have uh, the, uh, the second on the left, uh, you have Sugihara. And then also the envelope that was went along with the stamps. Uh, again, and at the bottom you have the uh, Sugihara stamp, and you have this here, is the, is the Curaçao thing that appeared on the visa, on the passport saying there's no need for a visa to go to Curaçao. So if you happen to be in Israel after the Corona thing is gonna be over and you're writing a stamp to the United States and you have to pay six shekels, ask them to give them the stamp of the diplomats for six shekels. It's a very beautifully done, uh, five, the five diplomats five of, of other diplomats that we honored as righteous among the nations, including Sugihara. Thank you. Wonderful. So here's a question for Dr. Paldiel. Child survivor Nathan Lewin says his mother, Pepe, was responsible for the Curacao visa from Dedecker and Svartendijk, but it was D Gutworth who promoted this to Jewish refugees. What's your comment? I, I mentioned that. His mother, that's uh, Pesia Lewin. That's, that's Nathan Lewin's mother. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's right. The, uh, he claims that uh, it's actually his mother who, who got the ball rolling and not these two students. It may have happened at the same time. I'm not going to get involved in this. Uh, this She's actually, I'm not going yeah, well, to, I'm, yeah, you know, we're not here to debunk anything except the fact that, that I will stand by the fact that, you know, her mother is one of the earlier, recip or earlier recipients on the list. Yes, I just want to add something. None of those that got the Sugihara transit visas supposedly to go to Curaçao of the thousands, not one person ever made it to Curaçao. Not even one. There were others who came to Curaçao, but not, not under the Suga, Sugihara project. Later on, the, the Dutch governor of Curaçao, who was uh, loyal to the Dutch government in exile, came to Israel on a visit, and he met with uh, Zerach Wahaftig, the Minister of Religious Affairs. And Zerach Wahaftig said, Your Honor, I have a question to ask you. Suppose some of these people that Sugihara gave a visa, indeed had crossed the Panama Canal and had arrived at Curaçao, what would you have done? And he told Wahaftig, and Wahaftig writes this in his, in his book as a footnote, I would have expelled him because no one was allowed on Curaçao. It was high security because they were refining oil that was pumped in from Venezuela. Venezuela was producing a lot of oil. 
And that's why you needed a permit from the governor. In other words, the governor doesn't give any permit. I would have told the boat, like the St. Louis, leave immediately. No one can land. Now, a half a year, a year later, the, the Dutch governor did allow some people to land in Curaçao. Uh, in Curaçao is one of, has one of the oldest Jewish synagogues in the Western Hemisphere. So that's very interesting. None of these Sugaha people ever made it to Curaçao. So here we have a question for the filmmaker, Achellen. Can you explain how your personal history, your family history, has played a role in your approach to the film? Well, I mean, there's, there are, I'm not going to say there are a lot of, I mean, there are too many coincidences or there's, you know, when I first heard about the story, obviously, like, like I said, I heard about the, the Fugu Plan story first. I mean, just to give a quick background on the Fugu Plan, early in the 30s, like in 19, I believe the first, first attempt was 35 or something, they, the Japanese actually sent an emissary to New York to go speak to the rabbi of New York offering up Manchuria as a safe haven for the Jews of Eastern Europe. And the rabbi of New York said, uh, you know what, thanks, but no thanks. America's going to come around. We're going to let them in. And just to make it real short, six months later, the rabbi turned around and said, sent somebody to Japan and said, we'll accept your offer. Too late. The government had changed from a civilian government into a military, very militaristic government. And the, and the offer was no longer open. So you can imagine you know, what would have happened if the rabbi in New York had said, let's talk about it, guys. Um, and then to go back and, you know, I'm half Japanese, half Jewish, and I grew up in Kobe. And like I said, I heard, you know, bits and pieces of these stories, but, but, but nobody ever really put it together. And for me, when I, when I heard about the story, when I read the story, and, you know, in, in, in a strange way, the, the, I mean, my grandmother was Scottish Roman Catholic, or as my great grandmother used to say, the Jews of the Roman Catholic religion. And she, you know, they, I mean, that too, with the Eastern, I mean, the, the Russian Orthodox um, part of Sugihara's story. So in that sense, those little details would compel me to tell the story, but also the entire experience of growing up in Japan knowing in the beginning nothing but Japanese, but not being Japanese, you know, and growing up Jewish, but not really, I like to say I'm Jewish by osmosis. I mean, there's, there's a little bit of all of that that I tried to bring into the story and, and, and tried to tell it. Um, so, look, I, I am by far, I'm not an expert on Judaism, the Jew, Jewish cat, Jewish, the Jewish, you know, religion or the, or the things that take place. But I, I, as a filmmaker, I rely on, that's why I have people who know these things and all of the little ceremonies that took place from, you know, the, the prayers that were said in the streets to the, the chanting by the, the, the Orthodox uh, priest, all of those things, I relied on those people to, you know, to, uh, uh, to actually bring it to me and to show me what it was. I'm not going to argue with them. I'm not going to tell them how to do it. They're going to, they're going to show me how to do it, you know, and also as part of it, Fortunately, on my Jewish side of the family, my, on my dad's side of the family, they got out in the early 19, 1900s. So they were not directly affected by the Holocaust. But as an interesting turn of events, my mother, who was Japanese American and born and raised in the US, she was in an internment camp. Let's be fair, it wasn't the same kind of an internment camp, but she was uprooted from her home in Lodi, California, first put into uh, the assembly center in Sacramento, then shipped down to the to the uh, to the uh, um, the horse races in Santa Ana out here, and then taken by train all the way out to Rower, Arkansas. Now, as far as as far as my mother is concerned, that was the best thing that ever happened to her because she was one of the first ones that got there. I mean, one of the first ones to get out on a scholarship. She wasn't there six months. My aunt tells me before she, was, she, she went to New York with a full scholarship to study at, at, at Hunter College in New York. You know, so there are, this is, I mean, it is what happens in life. I mean, some, some things end up in a tragedy. Some people look at it, and as my mother said, if it wasn't for the war, I never would have met your father and you wouldn't be here. I mean, you know, what do you say about all of these? That, that's, that's, why his, that's why, as a filmmaker, you can't make this stuff up. You think you make up something, that's never been seen or never been told before. No, somebody's going to, people are going to come out of the woodwork and say, that happened to my grandfather, you know, or I thought of that. I mean, people are going to take credit for it. Now, to, so 
that I hope answered that question. I'd just like to cover a few loose ends here of um, the gentleman in, in uh, Vladivostok, Saburo Ne, was indeed a classmate of Sugihara. Actually, Sugihara was a few years older than him. So Sugihara was more like the teacher's assistant and Ne was one of his students, okay? And he did, he, he facilitated the escape of the Jews or the Jews traveling to Japan. And, and there's a gentleman by the name of Tatsuo Osako who is displayed, who is in the film as the representative of the Japan Tourist Bureau, who is, says, who has that encounter with the little girl. And he, and there's a gentleman now named Akira Kitade, K-I-T-A-D-E, you'll find him on Facebook. He put out a book on the uh, Tatsuo Osako's, I believe it was his widow, gave this book to Akira Kitada, and there were 20 some odd photographs. And he went back and he found these photographs and he found the major, most of the people that, he, that were in these photographs and he, re, he recounts them in, not most of them, but he recounts their stories in the book. Now that has nothing to do with the Saburo Ne visa story, which I'm about to get, get, get to, but Mark Halpern, you see the, the visa that he's showing up to the screen right now. That is a Saburo Ne visa issued in Vladivostok. Am, am I right, Mark? I mean, can you unmute yourself yes. and tell us about it? You hear me? That's correct. Yes. It's, uh, I, uh, the reason I got involved in uh, Sugihara, uh, Mishigas, <laughs> was mm -hmm. because of uh, Kira Katada. And I met him through another Japanese gentleman. And uh, I helped him find four of those, because uh, uh, I'm a genealogist. So I found for him, with his help, four of those uh, people in the, the photo. But uh, so I'm interested in finding people who have visas. And uh, a young woman, not young, younger than me anyway, uh, who lives in California, I met her in Warsaw uh, a couple of years ago. And she just sent to me, because she found her mother's stuff, this uh, visa, copy of this visa. And uh, she thought it was a Sugihara visa. And as you can tell, and as Akira can tell, it was a visa number 21 from Saburo Ni. So all, the, all of the stories about Saburo Ni that couldn't be proven before are now proven. And so if anybody else can find any more of these, uh, we'd, we'd appreciate that. But here's one, it's number 21. And uh, these people were arrived in Vladivostok without a visa and without a, uh, uh, a Curacao visa as well. Yeah, if you look on Facebook now, Akira is is talking about these Saburo Ne visas, and and I mean it's astounding. I mean it's 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 very interesting. Well, I didn't know what I had until I sent it to him. Yeah, I mean if, if just by you it yeah. up, I noticed that the 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 stamp in bold says you know the Japanese Imperial, that's a Japanese Imperial Embassy or Consulate stamp, and that is not that does not appear in any of the Sugihara visas. And my understanding is that Ney had to stamp all the passports anyway, uh, just yeah, to authorize them. The exit visas or something, the final check before they could final get check. in. And he didn't care. He said if somebody else gave him the visa, it was yeah, okay no. with me. Yeah. I just want to add here that uh, one day I received, when I was at Yad Vashem, I received a letter by someone who introduced himself as the former ambassador in Berlin of the Republic of Manchukuo. When Manchukuo was an independent country, uh, of course, uh, a, a country, a puppet country of Japan. And he said that to, he wrote to me, I handed out a lot of uh, visas, Manchukuo visas, to German Jews after Kristallnacht, who were desperate to get out. Uh, so uh, I was very much surprised. We never received anything from Manchukuo. You know, that country didn't last very long. Uh, it lasted just from uh, about 10 or 15 years. But it was supposedly an independent country. It had the Japanese army there, and Sugihara was there. Even Sugihara worked for the Manchukuo government for a while. And uh, so I wrote yeah, back. Yeah, you may I, remember I, another film, The Last Emperor. The Last Emperor, right. That's right. Thank you. Uh, and I said, why don't you send me some more information? Uh, he said, he wrote back, I don't have this information. I'm, get, I'm very old, and I don't know where the, all the Manchukuo embassy documents, they went back to. Japan, and I don't have anything to give you, and so on. 
And, and so this case uh, never got any further. But it's possible that uh, there were some Jewish people, German Jews, who got uh, visas to go to, no, Manchukyo or Manchuria had a very significant Jewish community in Harbin. Uh, going back to the Russian Revolution, uh, there was a lot of Jewish activity, cultural activity in the city of Harbin uh, in the, what is called Manchuria or Manchukyo. So I'm wondering if you each have some final thoughts before we say goodbye for the day. Perhaps start with uh, Chelan Gluck. Um, you know, I uh, final thoughts. I don't know. I mean, I'm fortunate that I'm that I made this film. This film was actually released in Japan four and a half years ago, um, and it's got legs because I'm still invited to these events, and we're still invited to various events around the world and around the country to talk about this film. I'm fortunate in the sense that it is timeless. And it's a story that's gonna be, you know, equally relevant 10 years. It's, it's been incredibly relevant the last five years. I mean, when, we, when the, first, the film first came out, we had the, the situation with the Syrian refugees trying to get you know, into the various countries in, in Europe as well as the United States. I mean, I have to tell you the, one of the strangest uh, experiences I had with the film was in the, let's say that was, it was April of 2018. Uh, we know what happened two years prior to that. And we had a screening at the State Department of the United States, and it was um, hosted by the, co-hosted by the Japanese embassy, the State Department, the Japanese embassy, the Israeli embassy, and the Lithuanian embassy. And to be sitting there talking in the State Department at that the na at the beginning of the present administration, and you know, and 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 just dealing with, and I mean, it was just a very bizarre situation. That that's that's all I can say about that. And one thing I'd like to say is I'd like to thank everybody who watched the film, and those of you who have not had a chance to to watch it or to rent it on our site. Um, like I said, all the proceeds for the rentals of the film are going to go to the Susan Mendes Foundation, and so I'm going to leave it up um, for the rest of the month. Uh, and so if you can recommend it to people to rent it and watch it, uh, it would be, it would be great to spread the word. I'm going to put it up to the end of the month or until I get in trouble from somebody and, and I'm, I'm told to take it down. But that's one of the things, um, you know, I think, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that at the end. And you can find us on Facebook. If anybody else has, has any more questions, please reach out and, uh, you know, on Facebook or on my email, I'd be happy to share it, share it with you. And please, let's keep his story alive. And uh, thank you. Thank you again for coming. Um, before we get to Dr. Diel's final thoughts, I just want to mention something about uh, street naming in Jerusalem, that the Susan Mendes Foundation, thanks to Dr. Paul Diel, has succeeded in having the, state, the, the city of Jerusalem name a street, a square for Susan Mendes. And there has been a parallel effort to name a Sugihara square. So these two events might be happening at the same time. And once travel becomes possible again, maybe we'll have a big, a big program. Maybe we'll do it together, a big conference or something in Israel. It would be terrific. So Dr. Paul Diel, some final thoughts. Final thoughts. When we talk about everything that happened in the Holocaust, it's very, have to, very difficult to have final thoughts. There's a lot of questions which will remain unanswered. But uh, the more, because of that, uh, whenever, whenever there are stories of goodness, we have to highlight that, especially, here is one man saved thousands of lives. One person can make such a big difference. Uh, he didn't come to Lithuania to save lives, but suddenly he becomes a big hero, he becomes a rescuer. So this thing can happen to anyone. You may be challenged to do a good deed. Uh, you may be challenged to do a good deed to one person, to two. Uh, in some cases, like uh, Sugihara, uh, to numerous persons, to thousands of persons. Uh, he says uh, that he struggled with himself. I want to read to you something that he, in 1963, uh, we got a letter that he wrote to someone else. He wrote it in Russian. He was then stationed in Russia. He represented a Russian company. And that letter was translated uh, into Hebrew and then into English. 
And he was writing then, uh, not because he wanted anything from Yad Vashem, uh, he wanted somebody to help out his son. And uh, he said when these people came to him uh, asking for a transit visa, he didn't know what to do. And this is what he said. I really had a hard time being unable to sleep for two nights. I thought as follows. I can issue transit visas by virtue of my authority as consul. I cannot allow these people to die, people who have come to me for help with death staring them in the eyes. Whatever punishment may be imposed upon me for disobeying government instructions, I know I should follow my conscience. Approximately on August 10, I decided there was no further point to continue negotiating with Tokyo. The following day, I began on my own accord and with full responsibility on my part to issue Japanese transit visa to the refugees without regard whether so-and-so had the necessary documents or not. And then he said, I received cables from Tokyo to stop, but I fully disregarded these cables because I was acting strictly out of love for fellow man and in accord with my humanitarian beliefs. I had no doubt that one day I would be fired from my work in the foreign ministry. I continued to issue Japanese transit visas to Polish refugees until I left Kovno on August 31st. So you see, uh, doing act of goodness sometimes doesn't come easy. Okay, he had two sleepless nights. And in the story of Susan Mendes, he also had a few sleepless nights before he made that decision. He was going to disobey his government. But, 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 but look at the story, it leaves so much hope and so much inspiration. You cannot talk about the Holocaust without mentioning stories like Sugihara, Mendes, and others who saved. You gotta give people a sense of hope that it can be different. And it can be different because there were people like Sugihara who made it different. So that is the beauty of the Sugihara story, and the more we talk about it, uh, the more we will be able to prevent the reoccurrence of uh, the period of, uh, of the 1940s, 1930s, Nazi Germany. Thank you very much. Or, or the 2020s United States. Sorry to say that, but... Well, <laughs> who knows where we are heading here. And, and, and to add to that, obviously, if there's one thing I can say, you know, let's not sit quietly and watch it happen to everyone around us, including, and, and wait for it to happen to us. And as Sugihara's story, and as Susan Mendes' story, and many of these heroes of the Holocaust and, and other heroes that we've had throughout the years, one person can truly make a difference. And that, oh, yes. that includes you, okay? So do not sit idly by while these knuckleheads roll, run all over us. So please, let your voices be heard. Thank you very much. And yours too. Thank and you. Thank you, Mordecai. Wonderful final thought. I would like to thank our two presenters, our experts, our filmmaker, our historian. What a lively, wonderful discussion. Thank all of you for showing up to the event and asking uh, very interesting questions. And we hope to see you the next time. So have a nice rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>